but I'm, but I'm so glad to talk to you because uh, uh, a lot of this will be about Donner Pass. Donner Pass happens to be my favorite place in the world, and I've lived in Placer County since 1985, so compared to some people, I'm still, you know, the new kid. There is that Placer County feeling sometimes. But I've had the good fortune to, to actually get paid to work and live up there. For 13 winters, I ran a ranger station called Big Bend, which is about seven miles west of Donner Pass. And I was there winter and summer, and uh, this, this winter is remarkable. We were just up there last week going to Sugar Bowl, and there's more snow than I've ever seen. But not by much, but there still is more than I've ever seen. Um, I'm doing work with the 1882 Foundation right now to try and gain a national historic landmark designation for the Chinese railroad camps at Donner. And I'm gonna give you what I hope isn't a too long story about why and how we were working on that site in particular, because it goes all the way into the Bay Area, it goes into many other states, it goes all over the place with Chinese people doing really important work in California in the 19th century. And so I'm, I'm really glad to have you here. Well, let's, let's start then, because as you know, the California gold rush was a global phenomenon. It wasn't just confined to, to, to the United States. And of course, this is that one photograph that I've ever seen of Sutter's Mill with, with probably James Marshall standing in front of it. But that's what the mill looked like in, in 1849. In case you haven't seen it, this is the actual nugget that was found in the tail rays at Sutter's Mill. It turns out that it's the property of the National Archives, and it is, there is this photograph online, but you can go to the archives, I guess, and ask to see it if you, if you want to. How big um, is that? It's really about three millimeters wide. It's, it's not very big. It's bigger than Marshall found it because Sutter pounded it flat to, to see if it would flake. Meanwhile, over in China, though, there is this terrible thing going on from 1850 to 1864 called the Taiping Rebellion. That's when the Taiping rebels tried to overthrow the Qing dynasty, and over 20 million people died during that, that time. We had 640,000 casualties in the Civil War. They had 20 million. It's, I did the math earlier today, and they had 31 times as many deaths as we had in, the, in North America. Um, to add into that, in the middle of this rebellion was the Second Opium War. Now, in 1842, Britain and France had a treaty with China to stop producing opium. But the capitalists in France and, and Great Britain decided that they really liked the money from that. So they, they manipulated the politics and they staged a, another invasion and a second opium war. <sighs> Violating all of the treaties, and by the way, the 1842 treaty is what gave France and, um, and Great Britain uh, Hong Kong and Macau Island. So they just, they just totally violated these treaties, but did a whole lot of other damage to bring not opium use per se into China, but manufacture of opium, because most of the poppies are grown in the Himalayas and, and in uh, India during that time. In case you're not familiar with China, uh, it's a big, big country. And most of the Chinese who came to America came from the Guangzhou province. Hong Kong is right there, Macau is right there, and I've been as, as far as Guangzhou uh, back in the 80s. Um, but it's, it's, a really, it's a really interesting place about 3,000 miles away in a rocking tiny little sailing ship. But they departed right there from the Pearl River Delta. Be back in California though, pre-railroad, Chinese were a significant force here, and that's because Hundreds of thousands of Chinese fled the Taiping Rebellion. They fled the Opium War. They went all over the Pacific Rim to try and earn money to send back their families to keep their families alive. And there were a lot of Chinese. You probably are familiar with this photo. It's the famous photo showing Chinese miners working a sluice box in Auburn Ravine in 1851. How, how many Chinese were here? This is the census for 1852. And those of you that know Carmel Schweier, I got this from her. So I'm, I know that it's accurate. But there were, in, in Auburn, there was about 10,000 people in 1852. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, about uh, uh, 9,000. 5,166 were Americans, and one-third, 3,022 were Chinese. And then everybody else is Scottish and Chilean and German and French and everything else. They just weren't here in significant numbers. And I've since talked to other people I know in the southern uh, mines in the, in the mother load, and the Chinese distribution is, is similar then. Thousands of Chinese came, they were just as subject to gold fever as everybody else. But by the mid to late 1850s, you start to see this really increasing discrimination, and it's, it's, an, it's an awful thing. As humans, we are deeply flawed, and we tend to be suspicious of people who are strange to us. 
And it's, it's hard to be stranger than a Chinese person. You have a different colored skin, you have diff different shaped eyes, you eat weird food that you don't know what it is. You talk this language that no one can make heads or tails out of. You even write this crazy hieroglyphic stuff that makes no sense, and, and we are flawed people. And I haven't done all of the research I need to do on this, but I'm pretty convinced that part of the reason that you start to see this huge increase in discrimination by the mid-1850s is in the early part of the gold rush, people came to California being told there were nuggets to pick up off the ground. And the first three or four miners, yeah, they found the nuggets. And then after that, you had to do some work. Um, I live over south of town a little bit, south of the Maidu Fire Station, and my wife and I take a walk every once in a while along the uh, Sherland Canal. And if, you're, if, you're, if you watch what you're doing as you walk along that canal, you can see lots of mine addits, both above and below the canal, where people prospected there. And they, and they may have found a few flakes of gold, then they've quickly moved on. In the 18, late 1840s and early 1850s, Chinese would go behind the miners who had abandoned claims, and they would take the tailing piles, the waste, and they would carefully pan that with very fine woven baskets, and they would find the fine gold that the white miners had overlooked. And they were making money. And so the white miners would go, wait a minute. Wait, I, wait a doggone minute. I did all the work here. I dug this hole. Who were these guys to come in and take the profits from this? <laughs> well, they're the people that weren't so impatient they moved on, Charlie. But we are, we are weird people. So uh, one day I was digging around in the, in the online newspaper archive that I waste so much time in, and in 1854, the California legislature had a joint session, and they had an all-day hearing on who was the bigger problem in California, blacks or Chinese. It's printed in the Sacramento Union, and if you ask me later, I can probably dig out the date for you, but it's in 1854. And it goes on for pages. The union printed the entire thing, and they kept talking about how blacks are a problem. Now, slavery isn't legal in California ever, but that doesn't mean there weren't slaveholders, because this is pre-Civil War, and this is a country without any set laws or regulations because remember, the Mexicans only hung around the coast. They really didn't do anything in the interior of California. So there was no law, there were no norms, and, and although it was illegal, there, were, there wasn't the court system or the justice system to back it up yet. So they have this long discussion, they just, and they decide that blacks are a big problem. You know, all of the things that you would say about black people. But because Many of them are compelled to work here against their will. They can't send money back to their families. The Chinese, on the other hand, they're sending money back to China. They're draining California's capital. They're going to run us dry. And so they decide that Chinese are worse than blacks. And they start passing anti-Chinese laws, miners' taxes and poll taxes and literacy taxes. And during this time, if you are a Chinese person and you're robbed, you can't report the crime because you have no standing. The sheriff won't listen to you. You can't testify in court if you're a witness to a crime, unless the white victim gives, them, gives you permission to do that. There's a whole lot of things you can't do that grows organically. It's not state laws, but it's local regulations and local customs that become state laws, and the legislature is, is fully in line with all this stuff. Um, it, gets, it gets worse and worse and worse, and of course, these are both from the 1870s. I, I actually like this clipping. This is from the WASP, which was a satirical newsletter in San Francisco in the 1870s, and, 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 and it has a jackass talking about the Chinese must go. I, I really like that. But in 1873, a man named McGlashan, did anybody know McGlashan, Charles McGlashan? The town saint of Truckee, right? He is the leading voice in California for anti-Chinese sentiment. He comes to Truckee in the 1870s. He becomes a judge. He's an attorney. He becomes a state senator. He becomes a world famous butterfly collector. His, his collection is at the community center in Truckee. And his, and his daughter was another world famous lepidopterist, if you want a four, four syllable word for tonight. Um, but he also traveled around the state of California talking about what was called the Truckee method. And in this case, in February of 1886, he appeared at the Nevada Theater. And he talked about how to harass the Chinese until they leave. He, he didn't advocate violence per se, but he wasn't above burning some houses down. And in Truckee, if you look at the Truckee Republican, which he was the editor and publisher of, you can find ads that say, we proudly don't serve Chinese, we don't employ Chinese, Chinese go away. They had boycotts against a labor broker called Sisson and Wallace, who was a labor broker who worked with the Chinese, and they tried to run Sisson and Wallace out of business. They actually had a town festival where you could come and pay a little bit of money to, to help raise money to buy one-way train tickets for any Chinese that would leave. 
And there were three Chinatowns in Truckee because mysteriously two of them, one of them burned and the other one got moved overnight against people's will. And he, and he traveled as far north as Eureka. He traveled into Arizona and Nevada. He traveled into the San Diego area. He traveled all throughout the coast. And part of what he did was also ruin the fishing industry, which the Chinese were moving into as well during that time. But McGlashan is a really interesting and awful person, and most people don't know about that. In the meantime, this is 1862, they've started, or 1863 rather, they've started building the Central Pacific Railroad starting at Front and, and J Streets in Sacramento. And by the time they get to Colfax, which is only about 25 miles different, they're running short on white labor. A couple of reasons for this. One is that it's the Civil War, and a lot of young men in California have, in, have enrolled in the California Battalion, and they've gone back to fight for the Union in the Civil War. But on the other side, if you go to Nevada, you can get a really good job working in the mines of the Comstock Lode. And unlike California, which is starting to decline in the gold rush, the Comstock Lode's new. Everybody there makes money. You may be just a wage earner, but you'll make money doing it. Really tough, awful work, but it was guaranteed wages, unlike California. So a lot of young men would hire onto the railroad. They would go to the end of track. They'd work for a couple of days, and they'd say, hey, thanks. See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. And they would head up the Dutch Flat Road over towards Virginia City. They might have run into Haas Cartwright and those guys from Bonanza. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> so when they, when they got to Newcastle, they ran out of money, and they had to stop for a while. And then they finally worked their way up to a place called Bloomer Cut. And if you don't know where Bloomer Cut is, go down Auburn Folsom Road to Hurdle Drive, which is right short of the Maidu Fire Station. Turn right, and you can take about a two-minute walk to get to Bloomer Cut. This was the first place where Chinese were hired in, in early 1864 to work on the railroad. Um, I have always been told and I've always learned that they've hired the first Chinese here in Auburn out of the underemployed Chinese at the time. But last week at one of our meetings, we ran into a researcher who's doing his doctoral thesis on this. And he says that the early Chinese all came from Marysville. Marysville, which had the third largest Chinatown in California. Number one was San Francisco, number two was Sacramento, and number three was Marysville. So he, he's a scholar, I'm not, so I'm gonna take his word for it. But it, it just blows my, it blows my preconceived notion that when I go down Sacramento Street, I'm walking in their footsteps. But they had to go there to eat, I know. And Bloomer Cut is this amazing thing. It's about 80 feet deep, it's about 800 feet long. It was the first great engineering challenge for the railroad because this cemented gravel is, is uplifted river gravels from the Proto-American River but it's too hard to cut with pick and shovel. So this was the first place where explosives had to be used on the railroad. And the Chinese were hired not to do anything complicated, but simply wait till the blast was over, go in there and, and muck the stuff out and pile it outside the cut. But they worked out really, really well. And Bloomer Cut over time is remarkable because it looks today just like it did in the 1860s. And if you were gonna build a railroad through there today, you couldn't build a, a notch like this. You'd have to slope it way back and you have to make it very wide, but this is so stable, it's exempt from the FRA regulations that require that. And it looks just, it looks just like it did. It's really, really amazing. There's also a misspelled plaque at the trailhead for Bloomer Cut. When you go there, see if you can find the misspelling. Um, so the Chinese worked out really, really well and Chinese labor exploded. In January and February and March of 1864, they hired about 45 people. But look at this, they hired 730 in March 65, over 1,000, 1,300, 1,218, 1,320. It goes on and on and on. And these aren't total people working on the railroad, these are hires. There may have been as many as 10,000 Chinese working on the railroad in many different places. They didn't just go to the end and work there. They worked way out ahead of track, sometimes over 100 miles. But this was a big, big deal for California because, because of the discrimination, many of the little settlements in the foothills and other places almost died. I told you there were uh, 3,100 people in Auburn in 1852, Chinese persons. In 1862, there's 650, according to the census. But this caused Chinese to come back and explode and, and do all sorts of things, um, which, which is really, really remarkable. Um, it also led to the, a huge growth in a, in a steamship line called the Pacific, Steam Mail, Pacific Mail Steamship Company, which started on the East Coast running things back and forth from the East Coast across the Isthmus of Panama and then getting on another ship and coming up the West Coast. 
that was mail. They, when they lost their mail contract, it happened to coincide when the, when the railroad needed to hire lots of Chinese. They needed to go to China to find them. So the Pacific Mail Steamship Company started running a lot of trips to China and Japan as a result. And they were a hugely successful enterprise well into the early 20th century as, as a result of that. Building Bloomer Cut, though, also helped, helped silence some of the naysayers because people thought that the railroad would utterly fail as soon as they got to the mountains, including people like um, uh, William Holman, who, who said that a transcontinental railroad could never be constructed on terms applicable to ordinary roads. It's to be constructed through almost impassable mountains, deep ravines, canyons, gorges, and over sandy plains. But when they started getting into this tough terrain above Auburn, even he started to change his mind. There were still plenty of naysayers, primarily in San Francisco and some in Washington. But getting through Bloomer Cut convinced a lot of people to open up their pocketbooks and help support the railroad, inclu including Placer County. This county bought bonds uh, to, to support the railroad. The work gangs were divided into groups of about 30 people, and each crew had an English-speaking person who could talk with the foreman. And they all worked together. They were in the same 30-unit groups. And that's really good if you're doing really dangerous work, swinging picks and shovels. You want to know, you know how the other people work, and you don't want to have new people every day. Often, the, the, the crews had an individual cook with each crew. And sometimes, they even had um, um, healers, herbal, herbal medicine specialists with them. And they were good in many ways. You, you probably know the stories that the Chinese drank boiled tea, so they didn't get things like giardia from drinking right out of streams. But they were also healthier because some of the herbal medicines actually have medicinal value. And, and so they were generally healthier than the white people, eating fresh foods and not drinking out of the streams and, and taking herbal supplements. The next big engineering challenge, according to a lot of people, was Cape Horn. Anybody here from Colfax tonight? OK. Well, you know, you know what Cape Horn is. And, and you've probably heard the stories of the chairs were hanging in wicker baskets or bosun's chairs along the edge of a vertical cliff, lighting explosives. And if they didn't climb up the road fast enough, they were blown to smithereens. That's hooey. <laughs> and and I, I used to manage the uh, uh, Facebook page for the Railroad Museum in Sacramento. And every time I would put something up about this, I would get pilloried for, for <laughs> challenging what somebody had learned on their grandfather's knee. But there's no firsthand evidence that that ever occurred. And there's plenty of indications that it didn't. And the engineers who built this gave lectures on, in engineering journals. And, and they made speeches all over the country talking about how they did this stuff. They never talked about Chinese hanging from baskets. And I, I worked a little bit with the Stanford University Chinese Railroad Workers in North America project. And I talked to the professors there. And they did research for six years. Finally, just before that, pro that program closed, they found one newspaper reference to Chinese hanging in baskets. But they don't tell you where, and they don't tell you when. So Professor Gordon Chang, uh, who, who was the lead of that project, and I looked very carefully at all the places we know on the railroad. And I, and I know it relatively well. And we decided that if they did do that, it was probably in the area east of Donner Pass, where the cliffs are very steep. And it may have been at a certain place in Utah where they go through a river canyon where the cliffs are also really steep. But there's only one newspaper clipping that never talks about it. It never talks about Cape Horn. And, but you keep seeing this mythology. Here's, here's the painting Powder Monkeys by Min Situ. And it shows these supermen carving out this, this solid granite cliff, which is what many accounts say. Um, but look at Cape Horn. It's not vertical. Here's the slope. It's about 50 degrees. And if you look more closely, it's not granite. I've been up there. I've walked it. It's, slay, it's shale, rather. Shale's really soft. You can knock it out with a pick and shovel. It is kind of steep. You can see how steep that is. I wouldn't want to roll down, but the, you could also look at the vegetation. You wouldn't roll very far. You'd hit a tree or a bush and be stopped. So I suspect that if, if Chinese ever wrapped a rope around their waist and around a tree, it might have been here when they were pioneering this and carving out a footpath. But as soon as the footpath was there, you really didn't need that. So that's one of the great myths. And if you ever go to the Red Frog uh, Bar in Colfax, you'll see the monument that was put up in 1999. Look at it, because it's cool. If you haven't been there since 2019, it has a different wording on the plaque now. The original plaque that was put up in 99 talked about the Chinese hanging from baskets. Somebody brilliant at the Colfax Historic Society realized that 
and they put a new silkscreen sign over it that omits that language. I'm so pleased with the Colfax Historic Society for doing that. It's just, it's just wonderful because I'm all about us being as accurate as they can be. Then there's this mythology. This is in the Railroad Museum in Sacramento. This is a, a, uh, a worker's statue. It's bronze. It's actually a nice piece of art, I think. But look at the Chinese worker there. He looks like Superman. Look at those chiseled abs. Those, he doesn't have six-pack abs. He has 12-pack abs. I've had a lot of discussions with a lot of uh, the Chinese people I know. Many people love it. And I'm not going to, and I don't offer an opinion to the Chinese groups because I'm not of that culture. I can't have a cultural opinion. And, and I'm not an art critic, so I can't really criticize it as art. But other people that I work with more closely really don't like this because it perpetuates another myth about the Chinese. The men who built this railroad were tiny, scrawny little guys. And they got real muscular doing the work. But they didn't look like this. Um, and, just, and just so you know, this was funded uh, by donations to the United States-China Railroad Friendship Association, which is a group that I have <laughs> continuing connections with. I love them. I'm going to speak for them in June in the Sacramento Library. But they had intended to have this installed at the Gold Run rest stop on eastbound 80. And when it got delivered, somebody realized that they'd never gotten an encroachment permit from Caltrans. But now they don't want to because they're worried about it being vandalized if it's there. So it's in the Railroad Museum, and I think it's probably going to remain there. But I have certain people talk to me that say, we really want to put it up at Donner, or we really want to put it at Dutch Flat, or we really want to do all sorts of things for it. And I just have to zip my lip. I can't have an opinion about that. So don't tell anybody that I said this. Okay, It's our secret. Uh, here's Secret Town in 1878. And this is post-railroad, and many people have seen this photo and misidentified it as a photo taken during construction. But what's happening here is, here's the Chinese people. You can see the hats. They're filling in this trestle to make it a fill because trestles move, and they wear, and they catch fire, and they, and they rock, particularly when they're on a curve, and they're made out of wood. And they built the railroad in a big hurry, in a race with the Union Pacific to come from the other, coming from the other direction. So in 1878, when, when they realized this was going to work, the railroad hired, hired more Chinese to fill this in. And today, you can go there and see it. But if you don't, this part right here is westbound Interstate 80. And here's what it looks like today. You can actually, if, don't do this if you're driving, but you can actually see it as you drive up the freeway if, you're, if you look carefully. And if you take the secret down to exit and follow a muddy dirt road, you can get to it. But give it a couple of weeks because there's still snow up there today. And here's my first love, Donner Pass. It's where I'm going to have my ashes spread illegally because it's... Here, here's that magic notch that is so important in California and the nation's history. And it's halfway in Placer County and halfway in Nevada County. It's this remarkable, remarkable place. It's also really snowy up there. Have you heard that? <laughs> we were up there last uh, Thursday... For a meeting in Truckee, it was the day after the storms, and Caltrans did such a great job of opening the freeway, just for us, apparently. And then we went to Sugar Bowl, and I got to ride the gondola uh, to, the, to the offices there. I've never ridden the gondola. It was cool. But the houses were totally buried. I lived up there for 13 years, and I saw some deep snow, but never as deep as what's up there right now. So if you want to go with me to a tour of, of Donner Pass and look at the railroad camps, let's talk about mid-July. I, I genuinely think that we won't be able to see what, what I would like to see until mid-July this year. But it's very snowy up there. But here's what it looks like from the air. So here's a little bit of a, uh, a primer. Um, this is the original railroad bed. So what you're seeing that's whiter snow sheds, that's Tunnel 8, that's Tunnel 7, that's Tunnel 6. This is Old Highway 40, which is Donner Pass Road. Uh, the squiggles down here are parts of what was called the Dutch Flat Donner Lake Wagon Road, which went from to, oh, good, good. Uh, in the early 20th century, it was, it was reactivated, and it was signed as the Lincoln Highway. And, and you probably know that Lincoln Way out here was also the Lincoln Highway. That's a cool place to me because my, my, yeah, my grandparents brought my infant mother to California on the Lincoln Highway in 1921, so that's very cool to yeah. me. But this is, this is uh, what uh, Bill Udegeist, although I think he stole it from me, but I'm not, never sure anymore. We like to call this the most historic square mile in California because there's evidence of Native American use there 4,000 years ago. This is where the first group of immigrants crossed the Sierra Nevada with covered wagons, the Stevens, Towns, and Murphy Party. This is where the Donner Party tried and failed to cross the mountains and had such a horrible experience. 
This is where the railroad was built. This is where the, the Dutch Flat Road was built. This is where the first coast-to-coast -coast transcontinental highway for automobiles was put, the Lincoln Highway. And of course, Highway 40 here served as the main route into California from mid-Nevada until about 1964. Parts of it did. It came in in different pieces. So this is a really, really incredible place. Here's what it looks like from a vantage point above the old highway. Here's the old highway. Here's a piece of the Lincoln Highway. Here's Tunnel 7. Here's Tunnel 8. And Tunnel 6 is right over here. And the um, cultural area that we're looking at is down in this area. There's also a rock wall right here called China Wall that I'll get to in a second. Um, the Chinese worked in, in horrible, horrible conditions, including winter. Now, the first winter they were working on this tunnel, the railroad pulled them out for the winter, but they realized they were falling so far behind the second and third winters, they had them work year-round. And the snow was so deep. Here they are shoveling out existing track, but the snow was so deep to get from the places of habitation to the work sites, they often built tunnels. And so they were not even exposed to the sun, and they had openings in the side of the tunnels to dump rock out and human waste and things like that. But they were basically subterranean in snow caves for most of the winter. And there's lots of documents that support that. Um, there's also lots of clippings that tell you some of the things that went on there because this was of intense local, regional, and national interest. And I won't bother you with this. It's kind of hard to read. But this talks about a terrible avalanche uh, sometime prior to March 30, 1867. And a bunch of Chinese shanties were, were um, knocked down below the summit tunnel and, and down the grade toward the lake and buried. And Chinese were buried in there for 40 hours. But much to everyone's surprise, they thought everyone was lost, but the dead only numbered 17. Enough in all conscience, because they're Chinese. The last man was found alive, although 40 hours under the snow. He was in bed, and the roof of his shanty had crushed deep in such a way as to confine him there without inflicting bodily injury. When dug up, he got up and shook himself, exclaiming, exclaiming ugh, too much a hot. <laughs> and you know, this is not good reporting. But this is typical of the time. Re reporting then is not dispassionate and factual. It's, it's often editorial. So you're going to see things like that. They never name the person. They quote him in vernacular. Um, it may or may not be accurate. We see a lot of things where they do that, where they're calling people John Chinaman or, or Afong or, or a heathen or a celestial. Um, it's just kind of common in those things. A picture that you've never seen before because it was never published. It was found in the Southern Pacific Archives when the railroad shut down. But this is China Wall, that great stone wall that's there being built. This is Tunnel 7 under construction. This is Tunnel 6. And here's some of the structures that are there. So it's the structures and the area below these tunnels and over here that we're interested in for a national landmark because right now Union Pacific does not support a designation so we can't include anything on Union Pacific right away that they still own. Here's a close-up of this though. This is the, the China Wall under construction. You can see it's halfway being built. Here's a derrick that's used to move some very heavy rocks, sometimes over 300 pounds. Here's a worker. There might be two in that blur. Here's a horse or a mule, and here's a single axle cart they used to, to move the rocks. The rocks are the waste product from constructing the tunnels. And, and good, a good engineer will tell you that if you're building a road, you always want to make your cuts equal your fill, so you don't have to haul anything away. And they did a pretty good job with that. Here's what China Wall looks like today. And it's remarkable because it's, it's, it's considered a dry laid stone, stone wall. It doesn't have any mortar or any chemicals that, that hold it together. It's built like a jigsaw puzzle. And in every course of rock, there is a couple of long rocks that go well back into the fill that help anchor it in place. But you can also notice that the engineers who designed it also had it leaning back. It's at about 70 degrees. And so it's a good sturdy wall that for 130 years until it was pulled out of service supported hundreds of thousands of locomotives and passenger cars and freight loads and, and everything else there. And it would still do the same thing today. It is still owned by the Union Pacific Railroad, to, by the way. Um, this, is, this is the part that I don't like about this talk because I, I talk a little bit about the graffiti, but almost none of this was here prior to the COVID outbreak. Somehow, COVID, the pressure of being locked up meant that you had to explode and get outside, and this is one of the easier places to get into some really beautiful scenery. And for some reason that I don't understand because I don't have this bent about me, Taggers started going up there, but also graffiti artists, and, and, and there is graffiti art. I don't happen to like it, but it is art. And, and there are even websites advertising this stuff, and the paint just 
became insane. My friends at the Donner Summit Association have spent thousands of dollars painting this stuff out every chance they get, but what it does do is create a blank palette for new work. So we don't know what the answer is except to have people on site patrolling it. But it's nothing new. This is from 1919. This is an experiment called the Maxwell Military Express where they tested to see if, if autos and trucks could be used to transport troops and equipment in case of war. And you may have heard that in, a, in uh, 1917, Lieutenant Dwight Eisenhower did a trip on the Lincoln Highway as part of that first group. This is a second group. He didn't come over this route. He came over the Echo Summit route. Um, but some people feel that his experience there, which was not fun, was part of his impetus of signing the Interstate Highway Act in the 1950s. But the back to the graffiti, if you look carefully, there's a guy named Nicolini from St. Helena who wrote his name on the thing. Curse that guy. That's, that's nearly, that's, that's over 100 years old now. And if you know Pat Malberg, Pat's pet project is to keep painting the graffiti off of this. I sent her this photo and she couldn't decide if to laugh or cry. This is some of the stuff that we saw last year when I took a, a Chinese author up there and her family. And this is, this is really disturbing to me because I'm a preservationist. This is one of the drill holes right here. And if the paint wasn't so bad, you could see radial marks from the force of the explosion that, that blew these rocks apart. You can deal with this graffiti. You can use chemicals to remove it. You can use sandblasting or soda blasting to remove it. But when you do, chemically, you're exposing a new surface of the rock. Before this graffiti appeared, the rock was the same surface that was touched by the people who built it. With 130 years of oil smoke and wood smoke and asbestos dust from the brakes and you know somebody spit out the window and everything else. But it was the same surface that the builders had left. So anything that, that mitigates this will change that and irrevocably alter what I think of as a sacred site. My friend Ted Gong, who is the CEO of the 1882 Foundation, compares this to tagging a Civil War cemetery headstone. It's a sacred site where thousands of people worked and many died in this effort to change our country. This is one of the habitation sites here. It's a flat area, and I don't know if you can see it, but there's a rectangle right here. These are foundation stones from a building that used to be here. And over right in here, this is a hearth that was used for cooking. And when we've, when we've explored this site, we have found Chinese coins, we found pieces of, of rice bowls, we have found liquor bottles, medicine bottles. I even found a broken uh, piece of a pair of scissors there one day, which astounds me. Um, the reason is when people go up to look at their railroad bed and walk through the tunnels, they aren't even thinking about the stuff down there. So most of this has been left alone. There has been some looting, there has been some damage, but it's actually in remarkably good shape because people don't think about it. So I'm gonna pull out my men in black erasing thing before you all leave tonight and erase your memories, maybe. Um, here's, here's one of the 1867 photos of it. And this building right here, you can't see it in the light, but there's a dark roof building next to it. That's this site right here. So the archaeologists that have studied this know where the buildings were. And I know where a few of them are, but I'm not an archaeologist. Um, but it's, it's, it's just a remarkably wonderful site to explore. So here's some of the things we found here. Here's a piece of a teacup. The pattern is still used in good Chinese restaurants today. This was the coolest find. It's a ch we found two Chinese coins. They're Qing Dynasty coins. They were, we, we had a guy with us who was actually a, a coin collector. He sent us some research he did on them. Both of the coins were minted in the 18th century, but coinage lasted a long time in China. And so that was Qing Dynasty coinage, and it's still in common use at the time. And we aren't sure why they had this, because there weren't Chinese stores up there, but people may have wanted it as a keepsake of home or used them for gambling tokens. Or I used to carry an Eisenhower, do I was, Eisenhower dollar as a good luck charm, so maybe that's the same thing. But the fact that you find these things up there is really indicative that there were Chinese up there. So here's China Wall, this wonderful 75 foot tall dry stone laid wall. And it just fascinates me. And I could go on for 20 minutes just showing you weird obsessive pictures about it because I do things like that. But each stone is carved differently. It's each is custom fitted to where it belongs. And what's really amazing to me is when they built this wall, Charlie Crocker, the construction foreman and, and uh, Mr. Gillis, who was actually on site all the time, kept yelling at these Chinese to work as if heaven was ahead of you and hell was behind you, but don't stop and don't dawdle. And it took them a while. They built this over the course of one winter and the following spring to finish it because they eventually got snowed out. And there's a, about a five foot tall uh, rock uh, 
drain in the bottom of it that drains the little creek. And when trains would go across it, you weren't even aware that you were going across this wall. So there was no reason to be aware of it. But look at how beautiful it is. There was no road down there. There was no tourism. There were no rock climbers or the crazy people we have today, but they created this thing that just fascinates me. And I've been there many times. I've been there in all four seasons of the year. I've been there on moonlit nights and very hot days. I've seen wedding ceremonies there. I've seen drum circles. I've seen school groups telling the worst versions of the stories that they can, and I have to be very careful about trying to correct them. And one of the first tours we did for the 1882 Foundation, one of the women that came with us was named Jerry, Lynn, Jerry Lowe Sabato. She lived in Monterey, and she unfortunately she passed away last year. She was a descendant of a railroad worker, and we brought the group there. And right in front of the wall, she did a tea and rice ceremony to honor her ancestors. It brought me to tears. And now when I take people over there, particularly Chinese people, I show them the wall, and I back off because I don't want to be in the way. I want people to experience it on their own. Um, but it's, it's just an amazing and wonderful thing. And even the detail, like right here, there are quarry marks. There's one right there, too. If you, if you know what a feather and wedge is, that's evidence of using a feather and wedge. So the quarry mark is left by the worker who quarried that stone, who took a big chunk of rock and made it into the right shape. And look at how smooth it is. That's because these people were expert masons. And it's still here over 150 years later for us to enjoy. This is World War II. Uh, I don't know if anybody here knew Ken Yo, but Ken was a, a wonderful man. He recently he died about oh, five or six years ago now. Even as a teenager, he was nuts about the railroad. He was a, he was a real nut. He was nuts anyway. Um, but this is a photo he took during World War II of a cab forward locomotive leaving Tunnel 8, headed towards Tunnel 7. And I like this photo because my father was a fighter pilot in the Pacific in World War II. Most of the troops, most of the war materials, including pieces of the atomic weapons dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, came by rail. And, the, and they used different passes. They used the Feather River route, they used Hatchby, but the primary route was Donner because that's a straight line to the ports of embarkation in, in the San Francisco Bay. And I always wonder whether something that was pulled behind one of these trains helped keep my father alive. And it's also amazing to me that the people who built this, who were Chinese, 80 years later, their grandsons and great-grandsons were fighting the Japanese empire using things that were carried on the railroad that they built. I still get chills when I think of that. It's just, it's just so profound. And if my dad hadn't, hadn't stayed alive, I don't know where I'd be today. <laughs> It'd be very confusing. The big achievement up there, of course, is Tunnel 6, the Summit Tunnel. I have one figure up here that says 1,654 feet. I'm now hearing from better sources that it was 1,659 feet, but it's really hard to measure that. Um, 1,659 is the official measurement, it turns out. Um, this is a famous photo taken on, on one day in June, and I used to know what day it was, when the morning sun shines straight into the tunnel for a short time, which is why um, um, uh, Alfred Hart uh, shot this photo on that particular day. I have a photographer who's figured that out, and he, he shared this with me. Um, there are many photos of the tunnel. This is another heart image uh, showing, showing um, a horse and a cart and a worker coming out with waste materials from the, from the end of the tunnel. The tunnels were built using uh, explosives in holes drilled with rock drills. And up here, some of you people have seen them. I have two rock drills. The long one is bent only because it was abandoned over 100 years ago between two rocks and successive years of, of snow bent it as it was suspended there. When it was found, it was found that way. It wasn't, it wasn't designed to drill curved holes. Um, this is another one that we found near Troy, and this is a piece of one where apparently they sawed it off because it was stuck in the rock. I, brought, I came back with a sledgehammer and I extracted it, and in pulling that out, I became the king of England. Can you believe it? <laughs> Only a short time. But they used these rock drills and had, a trust, had, had one or two people holding the, the uh, Drill, and you can pick it up and see how heavy it is. And someone on the other end with a sledgehammer, it's called double jacking. And the sledgehammer operator had to really know what he was doing, and you really had to trust him if your hands are up there holding the drill. But they would drill holes sometimes three to four feet deep, and then they would either use black powder, or for a short time in these, uh, in these tunnels, they used brand new nitroglycerin. And I just learned the other day how you did that. You didn't pour it in the hole, you put it in a metal vial, and then you would carefully push the metal vial to the bottom of the hole. 
and attach a fuse to it and light it and run like the blazes. Or for a short time, batteries, but uh, apparently they didn't like the batteries very much. So this is a blast hole. Can you see it in the, in the light? I'm sorry the light isn't better. This is a blast hole right here, and you can see the radial marks still 130 years later, 140 years later when I took this photo, showing the force of the blast that, that cleaved these rocks. Um, this is one of my unfavorite slides next. This is the same hole in 21. This is why we're so upset with the damage. And in, in most, most of the graffiti, to be honest, is on the concrete snow sheds. I still hate it, but they aren't historic. But now they're starting to come into the tunnels. And in some cases, they're getting really, really bad. In a lot of cases, it's really obscene stuff, and I don't want kids to see it. And a lot of cases, it's just nuts. I've actually run into some taggers when I've been up there, and one of them was very chemically altered and thought he was speaking Chinese. So here's what Tunnel 6 looks like in cross-section. Um, it's remarkable. The longest and high, highest railroad tunnel in the world at the time. Their forward progress was 8 to 12 inches per day. And nearly two years to complete. So, so 8 to 12 inches, 8 to 12 inches. So somebody had a bright idea of let's go in from the top and start digging from the inside out. That doubles your progress. And so they, they dug an 80-foot shaft through that, the middle of that mountain. It took them about two months to do that. And then at a certain point, the foreman went down to the bottom and he said, okay, John Chinaman, you go that way, <laughs> you go that way. The bottom of the shaft when they finished it was about 12 feet in diameter and then they had to start building a tunnel from there. So this is the, this is, um, uh, the, the uh, tunnel house, the, tunnel, the, the covering over the tunnel shaft, it looks like a barn. This pond here is where the water came from and today Old Donner Pass Road goes right through there. And this building here is about where that big building is that used to be uh, Sugar Bowl Academy. So we know where this is. Um, it's uh, actually quite easy to identify what was there. And here's what it looks like today. This is the cover over the shaft. And you can't see it because the light here is so bad, but there's, there's uh, scattered wood remains here that is really old milled wood that was part of the barn that was over this. And then if you look carefully, there are three of the four stud bolts that still remain that anchored the steam boiler there that was the hoist. The steam boiler itself was the first locomotive ever operated in California called the Sacramento. And they took the boiler off when they acquired the, the uh, uh, California Railroad and they, sh and they hauled it up on sleds in the wintertime and they mounted it and, cre and created a steam hoist. It's the only place on the Central Pacific side where they use steam equipment to, to help their work along because apparently Mr. Crocker, who was one of the owners, was afraid of steam explosions in, in bad hoses. But they had a steam hoist, so they would lower men and explosives down, they would lower blast rock up. And a lot of this material around this is blast rock from excavating this shaft. Here's what it looks like from the inside. I was there once with a BBC crew and they had some very powerful lights, so we were able to light up the bottom. It's the first time I'd ever seen it light, lit up. And I'm gonna mention a, a video in a few minutes, and if you ever get a chance to look at that video, it's cool because the producer put a drone in there and he, sh and he shoots drone footage going down that shaft. Another picture that's hard to see, but this is the giant icicle that forms in that shaft every winter. Uh, my wife's brother shot this picture for me back in 2008, um, but when the railroad was operating, before trains could run each day, they had to send a crew up there to chisel this stuff out. Now this is several weeks, whoops. This is several weeks of accumulation, but Every, every day there was icicles coming down and if you weren't careful as a locomotive engineer, you could be impaled or killed by these things coming through your locomotive windshield. So they would send crews up there to always work on this and one reason that this section of track was taken out of service, it was so darn expensive to operate. Here's another photo of, of laborers and rocks is what it's called and this is near the east end of, of Tunnel 6. Here's my favorite one, it's the tea bearer. I'm sorry? Big rocks. Those are big, big rocks, yeah. Yeah, and little tiny men, five foot two. It's, this, that's why this work is so remarkable to me. It, it never, it never fa f ceases to amaze me. And when they came out of these holes, they would chisel them up and use them on different things. But it's, just, it's just amazing to me. This is a tea bearer. It's one of the famous photos there. Um, just happens to be one of my favorite photos, so I try and throw it in whenever I can. And this is the kind of work they did. This is a, this is a stone drain. And uh, much to my surprise, this is, this is my photo, but much to my surprise, I saw this in a, in a railroad 150th anniversary calendar one year. 
and I called up the guy who did the calendar, and I said, could you at least you know, credit me for that? And he went, oh, oh, sure, we just didn't know it was yours. <laughs> Copyrights mean nothing. But this still, this still serves its purpose to drain the railroad. It's, it's, it, it is just this remarkable thing. And if you look inside, it is much as it was when it was completed, and it just keeps water from washing out the raised track bed there. So this is brilliant engineering done with native materials found on site. But eventually they got out of the Sierra Nevada by, by late 1867. They were well into the desert. This is near Humboldt Lake in Nevada. This is called the end of track. And rather than big buildings, it's mostly tents. There are cars back here that hold uh, tools. And there was actually a barracks car that may, might be this tall one for the white employees. The Chinese had to, had to camp out in tents. And they made good progress across the desert. And of course, in Utah in late April of 1869, the Chinese and the, and the Central Pacific Railroad had a bet with the Union Pacific Railroad and Thomas Durant that they could lay more track. And, and Crocker, who set this bet for $10,000 with Durant, he didn't cheat exactly, but he wasn't honest exactly. They graded the heck out of this with everybody they could find well in advance of this day. They laid out all the rails in the right places. They laid out all the ties alongside the road. They laid out all the fish plates and the, and the casks full of bolts. And then they all set to work. And by the end of the day, they had laid um, uh, 10 miles, 240 feet. And Durant the weasel never paid off the bet. <laughs> Here it is, 150 years later, the Union Pacific now owns what the remnants of the original railroad, so I guess they've canceled their own debt. But on May 10th, 1869, uh, West and East met at Promontory, Utah. It's now a National Park Service site. It is a wonderful place to visit. I strongly recommend it. But in joining the rails there, they changed our nation, but they changed the world. They really, really did change the world. Um, this is the famous photograph that, that, that most people associate with this. This is actually after the event. So the, so the big guys, with few exceptions of Durant and, and uh, Crocker, are right here. But they're soon going to go back to their private cars and start drinking whiskey and smoking big cigars like everybody else did. The rest of these are hoi polloi. And one of the big problems with photographs like this is it excludes the Chinese. Or does it? National Park Service has, has blown this up and done a lot of study here, and we feel that there are three Chinese here. This wiseacre is holding a hat in front of a man right here who's probably Chinese. This is a Chinese person, and a person back here is Chinese as well. But they're the only Chinese seen in that photo. Of course, there are photos not as well known showing Chinese as honored guests who were in charge of laying the last rail. They were honored with that thing by, by Governor Stanford. And this is the, the heart photo that, that shows that. And the Park Service has identified the known Chinese that are in there. We still don't know their names, but we know that they are Chinese. This is an 1880 painting called The Last Spike by Thomas Hill. It was uh, commissioned by Leland Stanford to hang in the state capitol. It's, it's hung there for many years today. It's in the Railroad Museum in Sacramento. Stanford's entire political career was based on being vehemently anti-Chinese and anti-Asian. But his railroad was the largest employer of Chinese in the world outside of the country of China. His house staff at the Stanford mansion were all Chinese. They cooked their food, they washed their clothes, they helped raise Leland Jr., they took care of Jane Stanford when, when Leland was off doing whatever he was doing. Um, and I think it's significant that politics is a really dirty business and it's been dirty as long as, long as we know because here's Stanford, right there, this is a very allegorical painting. I should mention that the, it doesn't look anything like the people who are actually there. There are people in there who were, who were dead when this was completed, such as Theodore Judah, who died before the first rail was ever laid. But it's an allegorical painting. But one of the cool things about that was Stanford put some Chinese in here. He dictated what Hill should put in the painting. And they're close to Stanford. They're clearly subordinate. But he felt enough about Chinese that he put them front and center in this painting. It makes Stanford a lot more complicated for me. I used to, one of the things I did for state parks was I was the manager over the Stanford mansion. And I was also in, managed the state capitol museum. I know a lot about Stanford. He was a weasel. But he's not as dumb as I thought he was. He was more of a cagey weasel and, and, a, and a huge, huge bigot. But 
Politics is politics. When the railroad was finished, all the Chinese weren't suddenly out of a job. Many of them went off and did many other things, but Chinese stayed with the railroad and they did many other things. One of the first things that the Central Pacific did was build a route down the San Joaquin Valley and they crossed to Hatchby Pass, which is near where I grew up in 1874. Here's some Chinese railroad workers working on the Tehachapi grade here. And this is a big thing of popular culture. So the first, the first popular culture thing that I see about it outside of a couple of dime novels is the film Iron Horse from 1924, directed by John Ford. It's a melodrama. It's really a romance about a young railroad engineer who builds a railroad while he's in love with somebody. But there are Chinese in it, and they, and they did film scenes of it right at Donner Pass. Apparently, they closed the Lincoln Highway for a day right where it crosses the pass, and they laid rails on it. And there's a great scene in it showing the Chinese just working their rear ends off building the railroad over Donner Pass. They shot a lot of it out at Wendover, Nevada, that doubled for Utah and Nevada and a whole bunch of places. But there are Chinese workers right here. And they're on the wrong side of the locomotive because that's the Central Pacific locomotive over there and they should have been with those guys. You might have heard of a film in 1939 called Union Pacific, directed by Cecil B. DeMille. I've left that out of this because he only shows the Union Pacific side. There are no Chinese in it at all. But I met a man who was DeMille's assistant director once, whose job was to be behind DeMille whenever he sat down and put his chair there. He said he worked on the film. The next thing that you actually see, oh, and How the West Was Won has a railroad sequence in it, but again, it's on the Union Pacific side. There's no Chinese. The next one that talks about the Transcontinental Railroad with Chinese is Blazing Saddles. I kid you not. If you, if you pay attention in between yucks, you'll, you'll see that they're building the, the Transcontinental Railroad through Rock Ridge, and they have Chinese laborers. And so I just, I just think that's cool because I love Mel Brooks films. More recently, though, of course, uh, a few years ago, there was a TV show on AMC Networks. It's now streaming on Netflix, the paid version of Netflix, I think, called Hell on Wheels. It's a Western, and the background is building the railroad. And I love this show, not the least of which is the last three seasons, I was a technical advisor on it. But it's also really violent, and it's inaccurate. But at the same time, they honor a lot of the customs and culture of the Chinese and of some of the freed blacks. It's hard for me to explain this because it has a very 21st century view of race relations, but it's, it's masked in culturally appropriate stuff. And this is also how I met a professor at Stanford named Gordon Chang, because Gordon was the Chinese historic consultant. And, uh, and we, we become good friends as a result of that. But I, I used to lose all sorts of battles when they would call me and ask me questions while they were writing the seasons. They would ask me things like how to blow up trains and, you know, stuff like that. And, and if you, if you remember the last seasons, all of the action in town is centered in Truckee. Truckee didn't exist then. If they had gone into the nearest settlement, it would have been Cisco. And I pleaded with them to call it Cisco. And they said, who cares? Nobody knows what Cisco is. Everybody knows where Truckee is. So that's the difference between fictional TV shows and historically accurate stuff. But it sure was fun. And they flew me up to Canada. And I'm actually an extra in the finale. I'm unnamed railroad executive number nine. Also, as the 150th anniversary uh, uh, came closer, a lot of people started making documentaries about this. This is two that were funded by Trains Magazine. I worked on both of them as, a, as an advisor to it. But also crews from China and Germany and French television and the BBC and PBS came out and they made documentaries about this. So it's all over the place. And if you have insomnia like I do and you turn on Channel 6 at 3 in the morning and see yourself on TV, you may or may not be hallucinating. It's really disturbing when those things come on. The best film that I know of is actually this one produced by the USDA Forest Service called Legacy, which came out in 2019. It's, a, it's very much about this, this site in particular. It's very sensitive. It's very well done. It won some national awards at film festivals. And my friend Joe Flannery is the producer. Um, if you scan that QR code, you can go to it. But I've also got some cards here that, that tell you a link to it. It's 21 minutes long, and it's really... a, a film to take a look at if you got 20 minutes. Um, but getting back to 1869, May 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad is completed. Look what happens in September. I can't remember his name. I think it's Ferdinand Lesseps. He, he opens the Suez Canal. It's completed. And suddenly, you really can travel around the world in 80 days. And guess what? Jules Verne wrote a book about that same year. It made global travel possible for people who weren't subsidized by the Queen of England or the Queen of 
Spain. It made it possible and it revolutionized agriculture and freight and manufactured goods around the world. And the, and the Suez Canal is still very, very important and as so is the railroad. But this kind of sums it up for me. This was a guy named James Campbell who I've never found a photo of, but he's quoted in the newspapers at Promontory speaking again to the Hoi Polloi and he says, little you realize what you've done. You have this day changed the path of commerce and finance of the whole world. Where we now stand but a few months since could be seen nothing but the path of the red man or the track of the wild deer. Now a thousand wheels revolve and will bear on their axles the wealth of half the world. Drawn by the iron horse, darkening the landscape with its smoky breath and startling the wild Indian with its piercing scream. Philosophers would dream away a lifetime contemplating the scene, but the officers of the Pacific Railroad look and exclaim, we are a great people and we can accomplish great things. It really is hard to top that. But it did do all these things. Here's, what, here's some of the things that happened afterwards. A lot of Chinese stayed and they, they started cutting cordwood to supply steam boilers, not only for locomotives, but all of the industry in Sacramento and in the Bay Area and here in Auburn and things like that. You didn't, you didn't boil water without fuel. So there's thousands, thousands and thousands of cords of wood. And I was on a fire once in 2001 up near Immigrant Gap and we found remnants of Chinese woodworkers camps after the fire, it was remar remarkable. Agriculture starts to explode in California because suddenly you can ship your crops back east to people who are living in sub-zero temperatures most of the winter. And that means they can have fresh vegetables and things, but somebody has to plant them and nurture them and harvest them. Chinese were a great workforce for that, as were Hispanics, as were Chileans, as were Filipinos, as were Japanese. They're all over the place in agriculture. The Chinese also became major players in the fishing industry and basically invented the fishing industry in Monterey. I'm not sure about Mendocino or Eureka or the other places, but they really controlled the fishing industry. And then in 1908, 1909, a lot of discrimination totally destroyed the, the Asian contributions to the fishing industry. Um, a lot of them went farther east into the Rocky Mountains where people didn't know to hate them yet. And they worked in the timber industry and they worked in the quarry industry and they went up into places like Susanville and Eastern Washington and Oregon. You can find remnants of, of the work in the places that they, they were at. Um, the Chinese worked in many things. They worked in everything, agriculture, medicine, building, fishing, timber, culinary arts and domestic work, stone cutting, art and architecture. It's everywhere, you just have to know where to look. And that's what we haven't done a very good job of for. So at the 1882 Foundation, one of the reasons we're looking at the Summit Tunnel Complex as a national landmark is we want it to become a hub for other groups, mostly along the corridor of the railroad, but even extending out into that, that want to um, highlight and study and learn more about this Chinese history. The reason that Donner is so interesting is it was occupied for two years. So it wasn't a camp, it was more of a village and there's a lot of evidence up there. But the influence of the people who worked up there is everywhere and it connects directly with a lot of things. Union Pacific doesn't like it yet, but we're working with it. We hope that, that part of that future landmark will involve a physical cultural center. I'm aware that the Chinese Historic Society of Southern California has a large collection of artifacts collected from provide places for grad students at UNR and Davis and Stanford and Sacramento State to do research work there. So that's what it looks like in probably June of this year. But in the meantime, the 1882 Foundation is here and I have brochures that have most of this stuff on it. We have a nonprofit called the Summit Tunnel Conservation Association. In 2021, the site was named one of America's 11 most endangered historic sites by the National Trust which is wonderful. And that made Union Pacific kind of upset. Um, the video I talked about, Legacy, that's the one where, they sh where the drone is inside the center shaft, is at bit.ly slash TNF Legacy. Smithsonian published an online article called The Quest to Save California's Transcontinental Railroad Tunnels in January of 21. It's online, you can find it pretty easily. And I have some books here about ex exploring APA heritage, which is the Asian Pacific American heritage. Of, of lots of place. The Forest Service and the BLM are partners with us and we're, we're looking at ways to um, make more people aware of this. And I probably have gone on way too long tonight, but I really appreciate you giving them some time tonight. So I always close with a sunset. And thank you very much.